So today we're going to talk about, for the Journal Club, the classic um, papers in immunology, we're going to talk about two papers from the war years, one from 1944 and the other one from 1945. And these papers really established, introduced for the first time, the fact that there was more to immunology than just antibodies, which I think is very important and which the coronavirus people have sort of now just this morning, they were talking about it on the morning news about the fact that there are these things called T cells and that they um, actually help you get over an infection. And without them, you can't get over an infection. <laughs> anyway, the first paper is from uh, Peter Medawar in 1944, uh, and it's entitled The Behavior of the F and Fate of Skin Autographs and Skin Homographs in Rabbits in the Journal of Anatomy. Now, uh, Medawar was born in, in 1915, and so in, in 1944, he was 29. So he's just still a young guy. And to give me a little background on Medawar, he, um, he, he's, he's an Oxford-educated person. He went to, he went to Oxford uh, in 1932 at, at the age of 17, and then graduated in 35 at the age of 20, and then was placed on the faculty. So he must have had something going for him, you know. <laughs> Nine, ten years later, we find him during the war, and in, during the war, he continued to do his research, and the, and the Medical Research Council, MRC in, in Britain, asked him to, to um, try to understand why uh, homographs, as opposed to autographs uh, of skin, uh, were rejected. And of course, now we don't use the word homographs. We, we call them allographs because the, the genes are allogeneic. They are related, but unrelated. <laughs> and so they're allos. Because there was a major problem during the war, as you probably have surmised if you watched any, any World War II war movies, uh, particularly with the pilots, because the fire was a major problem, and also the sailors, and there were a lot of burn victims, and um, they, they really needed whole thickness skin grafts all over the place. But if they tried to do homographs or allographs, they got rejected and they didn't understand why that was. And so that's what he started to, uh, during the early part of the year, he started to investigate. And this paper from 1944 is really a tour de force. It is 23 pages long. And in, in, in uh, detail, Medawar describes the experiments that he's done and how he did them and what the results were. And um, it, it really is a, um, a turgid extra, or paper at this stage of the game. He chose to do these experiments in rabbits simply because rabbits, for a couple of reasons, rabbits were known to make really good antibodies and we still use them for that reason. But also they're just about the right size for these kinds of experiments. And the techniques that he described in this particular paper was is that they, they take a pinch of, of um, pinch grafts from the thigh of the rabbit and then put it on the back uh, or, or on the thorax uh, after shaving the, the fur and so forth. Uh, and that's how these things were accomplished. Most of the, he talked about large grafts, which were just a little bit less than a centimeter. So they're not big things, you know, centimeters, you know, maybe this big um, thick thickness. And then the small graphs that he talked about were only two or three millimeters. And he, through a series of experiments in lots and lots of rabbits and over a long time period, he worked out the behavior of, of autographs. So they take, that would mean taking the skin from the same rabbit and putting it on a different place in, on the rabbit. And he describes three different periods um, and because he also did biopsies and looked under the, and looked at the histology and, and so forth. So the, the first period period um, that, he, that the grafts would undergo, he calls the primary union and vascularization. Um, and then that's followed by a general hy generalized hyperplasia of all the different cells in the skin, underneath the skin in the, in the uh, epidermis or the, the dermis. And, um, and then that generalized hyperplasia is then followed by sort of a retrograde differentiation is what he describes. The, uh, the cells from the graph, which sort of spread out and cover up the skin and then be indistinguishable from, from normal skin, the grafted skin. 
In contrast, the, in the allographs or the homographs, he describes two stages. One is what he calls the primary cycle. And it's similar to what happens in, in the autographs. The, the, it looks fine for a few days. Everything seems all right. The cells, the, the grass start to become vascularized and, and cells are moving in and, and starting to proliferate and so forth. But then there's a massive in, invasion of white blood cells, primarily lymphocytes. And then the secondary cycle starts unfolding. Um, and that is the, the lymphocytes that have invaded into this area are followed by massive inflammation, edema, uh, and macroscopically red hot, swollen, and sore that we that I've talked about before. So, and then the uh, the graft just simply gets totally destroyed. So that was the that was the fate of these allografts, these homographs. So then he goes into and so in the that and and that takes about. I don't know, 15 pages of this paper. He's describing all these different kinds of things that are happening um, at the macroscopic level as well as the microscopic level. And then in the discussion, he, discuss he introduces the concept of the significance or not of immunity in this whole process. And that, and that became, became important because up until this particular paper in 1944, Immunity wasn't um, uh, wasn't used just to describe the rejection phenomenon uh, because immunity was was basically uh, reserved for what were thought to be antigen antibody reactions and actually Medawar couldn't find any evidence of antibodies in, in these uh, in these reactions with the skin grafts that he was studying at the time there was such a phenomenon called innate immunity still is but we, we define it a lot differently now. But innate immunity back in those days was, was reserved for what they called ready-made antibodies to, to red blood cells. So the red blood cells from another person or animal you couldn't you couldn't do red you couldn't do red blood cell transfusions because there were these naturally occurring innate um, antibodies that actually Carl Landsteiner had had uh, discovered in the early part of the century of the 20th century. Then there was actively acquired antibodies in response to an antigen being introduced in, in an experimental setting or after a, a you know an infectious disease or something of that sort and you would then they could they could uh, find antibodies in the serum. So that was called actively acquired instead of innate. And others, when they others when they had done these experiments, they weren't as careful as Metawar uh, because they couldn't they couldn't really discern that there was any phenomenon of immunologic memory. And that is, if you would place a skin graft from disparate um, animals um, on, on on an animal, and then and that was then rejected over the course of 10 to 15 days. If you then came back after everything was cleared and so forth and so on, and and, and placed this, that second uh, another graft on that same animal. You really couldn't say that this was a that the animal remembered that and, and could reject it more rapidly or better or you know with greater vigor. Except Medawar could, and he coined the term the second set uh, rejection reaction, where he found that the reaction was accelerated in time and it was antigen specific, so that if you would see a second set rejection to the same allograft. But if you then put a different allograft on from a third party, it would have the same time sequence delayed uh, as, as it would be in a normal situation. So this was very important because of the fact that Medawar realized that this was really probably an immunologic phenomenon. He made a point during his discussion to say two things that were really important. One is that he couldn't find any, any evidence of any antibodies. And secondly, that uh, when the cells infiltrated these grafts, they, they really didn't find a lot of uh, polymorphonuclear leukocytes, the, the polys. What they found was all these lymphocytes and mononuclear cells and large mononuclear cells, bl blastoid mononuclear cells. Now that's key because this is then probably the first description of cell-mediated immune reactions um, as discovered in, in what subsequently became transplantation biology. So that was Medawar's con contribution. He, was, he's, he's, um, he went on to fame and won the Nobel Prize in 1960 for his studies or his contributions to the phenomenon of tolerance and so forth. 
And um, he's one of my heroes. Uh, he's written several books. The one I like, one of the ones I like the best is it's called The Advice to a Young Scientist. And I learned a lot from reading his book. Just, you know, it's a monograph, maybe a hundred pages or so. Well worth it. I recommend it highly. But we're going to talk about him again because he came up with another paper in 1953 in Nature uh, that's very, very important. So that was Metawar in 1944 at the age of 29. And now we're going to move on to only one more year to 1945 when a fellow by the name of Merrill Chase from New York City and the Rockefeller Institute. Chase was 10 years older than Metawar. He was born in 1905. And he published a paper in the Proceedings of the Society of Experimental Biology and Medicine, what we call PROXOC in, in 45, uh, entitled The Cellular Transfer of Cutaneous Hypersensitivity to Tuberculum. Now, just a little background on, on um, Chase. He got his BA uh, from Brown in 1927 at the age of 22. His, his, then he went on to get an MS uh, in 1929. And then he went to the University of Chicago and worked for a while. And he came back to Brown and, and got his PhD in 1931. Then in 32, he was recruited to come to the Rockefeller Institute to work with Carl Landsteiner, who had just won the Nobel Prize in 1930, two years previously, for his work on the blood group antigens, which ultimately, when that was understood, allowed transfusion to be able to be happened, essentially, as a phenomenon. So that's, that's um, Merrill Chase. And actually, I, I, uh, when I moved to New York in 1993, I would see Chase walking up and down York Avenue because he stayed, I mean, he was right around in there living there near the Rockefeller and he ultimately lived until um, 2004. And um, so he died at the age of 98. So he's one of the grand old men of immunology that was sort of persisted in, in, at least in my lifetime and maybe yours too. So, you know, uh, last week we talked about Jules Freund in 1942 with Freund's adjuvant and, and the mix, mixing together of a water-soluble antigen together with a, um, a detergent kind of a situation to soluble an emulsifier together with mineral oil uh, and um, killed TB organisms. And that became the mixture that we, that we now use as Freund's adjuvant. Well, and I forgot to say last week when we were talking about that, the reason that Freund was working on that was is that he was kind of trying to come up with a better vaccine than BCG from 1924 for TB. And so that's why he was fiddling around with all these um, uh, recipes that he was dealing with. So Chase was using that recipe um, and he had been studying uh, with Landsteiner the, the, the ability of, the, of um, certain chemicals to cause what they called contact sensitivity. And probably the easiest and best and most well-known situations of contact sens sensitivity is poison ivy or poison oak. All you have to do is touch the leaves of those plants and you get an inflammatory reaction that is red hot, swollen and sore and itches like mad. Not a good thing to have. If you rub a little steroid on there and it makes everything all better. A little glucocorticoid, we'll get into that later. Landstotter had, and, and Chase had published a paper from 1942 using Freund's um, adjuvant and so forth. And they were able to show that they could transfer allergy or immunity to these some of these chemical compounds if they mixed them in as their antigen and stripped it in into animals um, and um, and then waited a few a few days and then tested for skin um, reactivity by putting a little bit of the compound on the skin of, of the guinea pigs and so forth. And they they found that if they if they did this to a, to an animal and then waited a while and, and then took out um, the lymphocytes from the animal and then transferred them into another animal, they could transfer the cutaneous um, hypersensitivity reaction. So that when you tested the animal, that it got the the lymphocytes um, uh, adoptively, there was something special about the lymphocytes and. Serum wouldn't do it. So only three years later then, during the war years, Chase, um, and by this time Chase was, um, he was um, 1945, he was 40. So he was 
he was on his own at this stage of the game. He had his own lab and his own group and so forth. And he, he decided to leave out the, the chemical that they had, he had studied with Len Steiner. And he just used the, the, the whole experimental setup with the oil and the killed TB organisms and so forth to see if he could co transfer contact sensitivity to TB. Lo and behold, that's the title of the paper. He was successful and he, he was able to show. And what, what he did was he took his killed TB in oil and he inoculated that into um, uh, animals. And then five to nine weeks later, he could test them for cutaneous reactivity by injecting a little bit of the, what they call P PPD, purified protein derivative or and the other the precursor to that was called old tuberculin. And basically this is ground up TB, killed TB bugs where they uh, undergo some crude separative procedures and they end up with proteins and polypeptides from the TB bugs. And so they put, that's PPD or old, old tuberculin and they inject that directly into the skin intradermally. And then you, what happens is then 24 to 48 to 72 hours later, you see an inflammatory reaction at the site of the injection. So after, this, uh, after the, the animals, he could demonstrate cutaneous hypersensitivity, he would then would um, re-inject into these animals some more mineral oil, petroleum oil, and um, that would cause a sort of a non-specific into the peritoneal cavity. And that would cause a uh, an inflammatory reaction. He'd wait a day or two or three, and then um, wash out the peritoneal cavity and take all of the cells that he could get out of there. Um, and uh, then he would take those cells and transfer it to another animal. That was the adoptive transfer. The, the test was: now, do these animals get cutaneous hypersensitivity to PPD and old tuberculin? And the, the, the cells that he used were a gamish of 15 to 30% polys, polymorphonuclear leukocytes, 20 to 35% lymphocytes, and 50 to 65% large mononuclear cells. And I think the, 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 some of them were probably monocytes, but I think an awful lot of them were also large blastoid lymphocytes. Transfer them to a new animal and then wait at least two days and then test for cutaneous hypersensitivity. What they found that they could do that, or he could do that, and, and he would get a positive reaction in that kind of a cutaneous reaction in that kind of an instance. Um, he tested a bunch of other things as well. And actually, I should say, in contrast to Metawar's paper that's 23 pages long, Chase's paper, the next year is only two pages long. So you can read that one <laughs> very easily. They, they also, he also tested for, he, he tried to heat, heat kill the cells, heating them to 48 degrees centigrade for 15 minutes. And they didn't, they couldn't transfer the sensitivity. Free saw cells couldn't transfer the sensitivity. Serum couldn't transfer the sensitivity. But in addition to these peritoneal exudate cells, um, splenocytes and lymph nodes, lymph node cells also transfer the sensitivity. So basically he ends up in the, in the discussion of his, a little short discussion of conclusion of his paper that this is the same phenomenon that he'd already shown with the cutaneous hypersensitivity transfer to the chemical um, antigens. So that, so these two papers, this basically solidified the idea that there's something else going on in addition to antigens and antibodies to mediate an immune response, an immune reaction. The reaction was different the, uh, from an antigen antibody reaction, it was delayed. It took a while to develop, 24, 48, 72 hours to get this positive skin test of the cutaneous hyper, what they call, and now we call, uh, the, the acronym nowadays I call is DTH or delayed type hypersensitivity. When that's the sine qua non of cell mediated immunity mediated by T lymphocytes. But of course, we didn't really, T lymphocytes didn't come into being until 1965, 1970, and we'll get into that a little bit later. It took a long time. So after this, after 45, there was this phenomenon, poorly not described beyond these two, pa two papers, that there were also 
cells involved in this immunological reaction. That's, I think, all I want to say today. Uh, and so I'll stop there. Thanks. So if you've liked this, if you like this journal club, let me know, you know, like it, give me feedback on the whole thing. And so thanks so much for listening.